Our next guest has been forever changed since losing her son David to a sniper while serving along the border of the occupied territories. No doubt today's Israeli Remembrance Day is a bitter pill to swallow for Robbie Damelin, but this South African native has found a way to find peace and reconciliation, even amongst the Palestinian who killed her son. And uh, we are very pleased to uh, have have you join us. Thank you for coming in. I'm sure Thank this you is for inviting me. I'm sure this is uh, you know one day a year that is particularly. Uh, Emotional for you? Not no. really. I think every day, you know, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't remember David's smile or something or the cooking or talking about philosophy or concerts or movies mm. or all the things that we did together. So, you know, I, I think Remem Remembrance Day in many ways is for the Israeli public. Right. But for us who've lost children, there isn't a day that goes past that you don't remember. Well, I just can't even imagine, I mean, in the story, you know, the story behind your son, I mean, he he was studying philosophy, he'd already done the army, and this happened when he was doing, right, Milouim, which is like kind of the reserves that everybody has right. to do kind of once a year. Right. Milouim. So, you know, how did you get the news? And he didn't even want to be there. Well, you know, there's this quandary that goes through the head of many people. And I've noticed of late that, that there's a kind of fear of peacemakers. And we don't know who the person was behind the gun. I'm talking about David. We don't know who those soldiers are. We don't know what goes through their mind when they get called to go and serve in the occupied territories, which they have doubts about. But nevertheless, they're torn because of the sense of loyalty to their soldiers. Right to um, the students he was teaching who were going to be inducted into the army. So these are stories which aren't only about David. It's about everybody. Everybody. You know? But how were you able to kind of make that, you know, shift of being a grieving mom but also wanting to do something to help find commonality even amongst the family and, you know, and his killer well, who's know, in jail still, right? Yes. The, when, when the army came to tell me, apparently the first thing that I said is you may not kill anybody in the name of my child. So oh. there must have been something there. Mm -hmm. And I knew almost immediately that I wanted to do something to prevent other families, both Palestinian and Israeli, from experiencing this pain. And then I was invited to a seminar of uh, about 140 Palestinian and Israeli bereaved parents. And when I met the mothers, especially the mothers, Palestinian mothers, I knew that we shared the same pain. And that's the most powerful thing. So that was really that a big have. turning point for you? Not really, because I grew up in South Africa um, in the anti-apartheid movement, and I'd always had a, a kind of a social conscience, even since the even age of time. five. Wow. So, but it's, it must be bittersweet that here you are, you know, someone who is such a, you know, social activist, but then to have to be, you know, an activist for something, you know, that touches you so personally. I mean, how did you make that shift? You know, once you started, you know, joining these support groups, the Parent Circle, Families Forum. It's not a support group. It, not right, at it's all. a group that's actually working with the families directly, correct? No, we are bereaved parents who work with the public because what we believe is there has to be a framework for a reconciliation process to be an integral part of any future peace agreement. Right. Otherwise, all we have is a ceasefire. So our work is on the ground with the general public. Of course, being with other bereaved parents has, uh, brings a sense of solace because of what happens from that. They're the only people that, that understand. could understand. That you don't need right. to use words to no. explain. And if I want to laugh or if it's my birthday or David's a day that's just cry for me, no I can reason. Do whatever the hell I like. Right. Yes. So you actually went as far as, you know, you've written a letter to, you know, the person who actually, you know, killed your son. I mean, what how long did it take for you to be ready to actually take that step? Well, I told you almost immediately I joined the parent circle. But um, in the beginning there was nobody there wasn't a face of the person that killed David. He was caught something like two years later, and that's when it really became difficult. You see, because that's when I had to see if I'm honest. It's mm. terribly easy to go around the world talking about reconciliation and peace and rainbows Until and flowers. Until there's a moment to actually physically you know, do it. Rainbows and flowers and bad poetry and all this <laughs> kind of thing. But on the other hand, how could I, how could I do this work if I wasn't willing to do it to, to put walk your the own. talk. Exactly. 
So it took me a while and I didn't sleep for many months. And then I wrote a letter to the family who were very shocked, as you can imagine. Of course. And then um, I, of course, with my wonderful patience, expected to get a letter back the next day. Did it happen? There's no such thing as instant reconciliation. It can take years and it can never happen. So it took about three and a half years and I got a letter which wasn't exactly from Martin Luther King. It was saying I'm mad and I should stay away from his family and oh, oh yes, and that he killed 10 people to um, free Palestine. But you see, I'd known from his parents that when he was a very little boy, he saw his uncle violently killed by the Israeli army and he lost two uncles in the second uprising. So he was on a path of revenge. Yeah, when and nothing would change. And if the family no, isn't going kind of to kind of instigate that politics, seed, it's, actually, it right. was revenge. And wow. then I went to South Africa and we made a film because I wanted to explore what forgiving means and also to understand what happened in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to meet people who were ex-perpetrators and ex-victims who came to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and told their stories. And actually the perpetrators, if they told the truth, they got uh, amnesty, which is hard for a lot of people to swallow. But what else could you do? Mm -hmm. You know, what were you going to um, accuse every person with a white skin that uh, of of uh, uh, benefiting from the apartheid, which is what they do. So did, how so me. quickly? So now that we're here talking about you know Yom Azikaron, obviously, and you know Yom Atzmaut, you know, are you finding just in you know each year are you further along? You know, in, are we further along in the process of families on both sides of the conflict? You know, finding some kind of commonality. Look, the in the realization face of that there is the shared pain is the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, many Palestinian mothers who never had though I always talk about mothers because that's what's closest to me really but there are men in our group and there are sisters and, and brothers sisters, right? and family members but for me mothers are the most powerful for change you know I, I was in the States and I met the black mothers mm -hmm. who stood on the stage Democratic Convention who'd lost children and I met mothers of police officers and we got together and spoke on a platform and we share the same pain and that's what makes it so powerful. And if you take a person who has um, never spoken to the other and suddenly they discover each other's humanity and you watch what happens the, because we don't know each other. And the minute I began to know Bushra and Nasra and all of the mothers both here in South Africa and in America, I discovered this commonality of pain. We're sisters in pain. So there's no bridge to be built. There are things to learn along the way, but there's this innate sympathy for each other. The empathy comes later when you really understand and begin to trust. So we've done so many projects, you know. Um, I know this is a program about culture, and we very much use art as a way of um, getting people who wouldn't normally come to or listen to us. Us, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we create, for instance, this book. It's called Jam Session. Beautiful. We're, we're out of time, but I, no, I, this is that. great.